Okay, okay. So, okay, so we can start the second lecture is about uh, ZMEFT. Okay, so yesterday we gave uh, a very broad introduction about what EFTs are in general and what ZMEFT exactly is and uh, why we think it can be useful. Uh, today we start looking a little bit closer at the ZMEFT Lagrangian and doing some calculations and getting to the point of the predictions. So we said uh, yesterday the ZMEFT is this expansion in canonical dimensions, so we have all these orders. And if you remember, we also said um, that the odd dimensions always violate either the baryon or the lepton number. So they are interesting if you um, specifically want to target that kind of new physics. But in general, so for the target of the LHC, people are mostly interested in effects that preserve the baryon and lepton numbers and just give corrections to uh, more um, conventional processes, let's say. Uh, so the first order that is interesting is the dimension six. And this is the thing uh, on which we are going to, uh, to focus today. Okay, so we're gonna talk for 90% of the time from now on about uh, dimension six because this is the leading order of, of this method. Um, so maybe one thing that I should uh, mention, I don't know if I said it uh, super clearly yesterday. So we said you have all these Lagrangians in different dimensions. And for instance, at dimension six, this is something that has a, a canonical, uh, so it, it's a very well-defined class of operators. And the way that this Lagrangian is typically written is that it is a sum over a bunch of Wilson coefficients that are suppressed by some placeholder uh, new physics scale lambda squared because it's dimension six. And then you will need to have some uh, dimension six uh, operators. And they're labeled with an I, so you imagine it as a series of interaction terms. Now, uh, one important point is that uh, this set of operators OI um, typically is selected such that they form a complete and non-redundant basis. What does it mean? So if you start just taking um, the standard model fields and breaking down everything that possibly comes to your mind that has uh, dimension six. You will write down a very, very large number of terms. No one has ever counted them, but it's, uh, it's really huge. But several of them uh, will actually lead to identical physics. So there are many uh, redundancies that can be quite uh, easily identified when you write down um, an EFT Lagrangian. Actually, some of them exist also at dimension four, so you don't think about them anymore. Uh, so there are mainly three classes of, of redundancies. One is the integration by parts, which is the same concept that you just saw in the previous lecture. Uh, integration by part in this context means um, that operators that are equivalent about basically shifting derivatives from, from one term to another, they are, um, they are equivalent. Um, yeah, so I guess we don't, we don't specifically need to see an example, but uh, so, okay, we can make an example. So if you have an operator that you can write down like this, so you have something like that. Uh, this is dimension six, right? So you have two Hig four Higgs doublets, so that's four, and two derivatives, it makes six. You can decide to take uh, a simple derivative of this object, a simple derivative because H dagger H is a gauge singlet, right? Um, and this is equivalent to minus H dagger H and the box of H dagger H, for instance. So like you take one derivative and you move it to the other term, uh, there's a minus sign because what you're really doing is the integration by parts. So you are saying that this, the sum of these two objects is a total derivative. And the total derivative uh, gives vanishing effects, okay, on, on the Lagrangian. So this is one kind of redundancy. Another kind of redundancy is a question of motion. Uh, this is a redundancy that technically holds uh, on shell. So. In practice, it is always there. So whenever you want to use uh, your EFT to do phenomenology, um, this redundancy is always true because the fields that appear in your, um, in your operators will always be evaluated on shells. If you want to do phenomenology, you mean I'm gonna take this Lagrangian and use it to calculate amplitudes. And then you will always have some um, 
on-chain external states, and then these redundancies will always come in. Uh, sometimes they are not considered redundancies uh, when people do matching, for instance. So we mentioned matching yesterday. And when people do matching at one loop, there are some subtleties for which sometimes uh, you really need to match on, a, uh, on an off-shell basis, essentially. So there, this is not uh, an enforced redundancy anymore. And then the basis is reduced eventually when, uh, uh, when one wants to do phenomenology again. And the third class of redundancies is Firth's equalities. Uh, this is something that is relevant for four Fermion operators. I'm not going to write them down because it's a bit uh, technical, but the point is uh, typically if you have uh, some operator, I'm going to write it like that. Then you have a Psi 3 and a Psi 4. So you have some uh, four Fermion interaction. And this gamma is some Lorentz structure. So depending, so it could be like a gamma mu and the projector for the chirality. It could be a sigma mu nu. It could be just a scalar contraction with a chirality flip. It could be anything, right? So Fiat's relations give you rules for how you can recast um, this kind of operator flipping two of them. So typically the structure of a Fiat's identity is that um, an operator like this will be equal to some sort of uh, combinations of new structures, which are, let's say, alpha and psi 4. And then you have uh, psi bar 3, gamma beta, and psi 2. And you are summing over so the alpha beta combination. So essentially, each of these structures is equal to a combination of structures where these two guys have been flipped. And this is used to construct bases sometimes. Um, like if you have a current that is quark, 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 lepton, lepton is the same as quark, lepton, lepton, quark, or something of, of this sort. So you decide how to arrange it in, in a way. So uh, what people do is that they construct a basis by technically writing down everything that is possible and then they implement some sort of algorithm, literally, um, that gets rid of these three types of redundancies to remain with something that has only one of each. So there remains with something that does not contain redundancies anymore. Um, and it turns out that uh, the number of parameters that you have in um, a minimal basis, let's say, is independent of which operator you decide to keep. So you could construct a basis with this guy or with this guy, it doesn't matter. Uh, in this case, it's always one parameter. And the, the counting always, uh, always works out. OK, so uh, there are several bases I've been proposing in the literature. As you can imagine, this was a kind of a historical process. People had many ideas, tried many things, built partial things. Um, one that is very popular right now is the basis that you see here. Uh, this is only half of it, really. I'll show you the other half in a second. Uh, so this is called the Warsaw basis because it was proposed by a group in Warsaw um, in 2010. So actually, the original attempt at building a complete basis of operators at dimension 6 comes from Buchmuller and Wheeler in 86. Um, unfortunately for them, it turns out that they had a small redundancy. Uh, and these people basically gave a master, th master thesis to a student to check the basis. He found the redundancy, and this became like a, a thousand citation paper uh, <laughs> 10 years later. I think, uh, yeah, I think Matteo Ziskenkli was the master student, so have faith in your thesis. <laughs> you might find interesting things. So this is a new standard. It's a new standard um, for a bunch of reasons. So one, one reason is that it implements a clear algorithm about how to reduce the basis. And this is very important when you do the matching operation. So typically, if you do the thing that we said yesterday, like you do this functional thing of taking the classical solution, replugging in the Lagrangian, expanding, you get all sorts of crazy things. So like you can get any arbitrary structures. And then if you want to bring it down to a basis that you know in which you have done predictions, you need to know how to do it. And that is highly non-trivial. So if you have a basis that has a clear algorithm to tell you which invariant goes to where, uh, this is a, a huge uh, advantage, let's say. 
So uh, if you look closer at this basis here, so the operators are conventionally separated in classes because people need to organize this in, in some way. Uh, so you always have some class of operators that have these uh, three field strengths. Uh, you will notice that some have a tilde, so they have a GG dual or a W dual. Um, and so this violates CP, the, the two with the, with the dual, while the other two don't. Then you always have a sector that has only Higgses. Um, there is always this guy, which is uh, phi dagger phi to the cube, which modifies the uh, scalar potential. And uh, for some fundamental reasons that I will not have time to explain, you always have two operators that have four scalars and two derivatives. You cannot get rid of, uh, of them by any way. So if you look at this, you might think, oh, there's a box here, so I could use an equation of motion. Actually, no, because you have to start opening this product, and then eventually, if you do the math, you will always circle back uh, to having two of these operators. This is really related to some properties of the scalar sector. Then you have stuff that modifies the Yukawa. So something that you always have that is very common in SMEFT is that you, you start having some sort of structure. So this is literally the Yukawa coupling of the standard model that is in brackets there. And then you multiply by H dagger H. This always increases the dimension by two, and this you always get for free in, in many places. Another example is this. So these are all the kinetic terms of the gauge bosons, and you multiply them by H dagger H. Uh, there's a small exception here. So it turns out that there's one more structure that you can build. Uh, which has uh, the W, so the SU2 triplet contraction between the two, um, the two Higgs tablets. And here again, there are uh, CP even and CP adversions. Then you have all the dipoles. So there are uh, electric and magnetic dipoles, which because now this is SU2 cross U1, they are separated in B mono and W mono. And you have chromomagnetic dipoles with a, a gluon, um, with a gluon attached. And you have this class here, which looks a bit obscure, uh, but really what it does is that it introduces corrections to uh, the couplings of um, the Z and W bosons to fermions. Um, so maybe I can give you, no, I don't have it written, but I can, I can guess it. So as a cheat sheet, whenever you see something like this, there's a D mu H, something like that, so you have this kind of current, so the double arrow means that you are taking, now I hope I'm getting the sign right, but you're getting once the derivative to the right minus uh, the derivative to the left. Uh, when you go to unitary gauge, this is essentially uh, an I maybe and the Z mu. No, the I maybe, I don't remember if the I is there, but okay. This becomes essentially a Z. Whenever you have a uh, version, so you have a version here that has an I on top, uh, that means, so whenever you have this thing is written with a big I, so this is the SU2 contraction I, uh, this means that now you are putting a Pauli matrix in the middle. So you have the d mu H, and then you have the mu H dagger, the I, another Pauli, and the H. Um, so because this has a Pauli matrix in between, this is not a scalar quantity, this is a matrix, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a matrix sandwich between the two Higgses, and then the, the index I is contracted with the Pauli that goes into the fermion current. Uh, so this, in the end, gives you corrections to both the Z and the W. So from here, you get essentially corrections that have uh, W plus, W minus, Z minus Z. And then when you pair it up to, uh, when you contract the index I to, um, with the one in the fermion current, then the charges uh, work out as they should to have corrections to the standard model currents. There is one more thing that these operators give you. Uh, so I was a bit quick here. So this doesn't really give you just these. Uh, it gives you these times V plus H, because that's what you get when you open up the, uh, the Higgs um, the Higgs doublet. So what you get typically, now you should check if the dimensions work out. I don't know if I have all the numerical factors right, but uh, so what you get is some sort of correction to the Z interaction that goes like V squared over lambda squared. But then you also get uh, a point like vertex between the two fermions, the Z and the Higgs, that just comes from the fact that you are opening up the, the doublet. And the same thing happens with this kind of operators, but with, so with both the Z and the W. So when you have a three, you have 
both of them, and when you have the singlet, you have only, only the Z version. Okay, so the other half of the basis uh, is the four Fermi operators. So this is the upgrade of the Fermi theory to the standard model symmetries. Uh, there's a lot of them, uh, but you see that there's only like, if, if you look at this, you might think of some more structures, but they are just not independently there because uh, they are related by, so they can be reduced by fields. So for instance, you see that only in this particular case, you have explicitly the call or octet contraction appearing, while in the other ones, um, it can be removed. So you can always uh, do a Fierce rotation such that, um, well, okay, sorry, in this case it's trivial, but in, uh, in some other cases around here, you can, uh, you can always remove it. Uh, there are a few operators that can violate the barrier number. We're going to neglect it, and they're most often neglected uh, for the same reason that we don't consider odd dimensions. Uh, but in principle, there, there can be a few at, um, at dimension six. Okay, so um, there is a point about how many parameters does this contain, because if you think about the thing that I told you yesterday, so we would like to write one G Fermi, right, one with some coefficient for each of the interactions that we have, and then we want to measure it and figure out if there's some pattern or some indication about new physics. So how many do we have to fit? <laughs> well, this has been counted. Uh, there is this uh, well-known paper up there already in 2015. Uh, that use uh, something called Hilbert series techniques. Essentially, it's some sort of sophisticated math to count how many invariants you can have, knowing what fields you are inserting and what symmetries they have to respect. Um, and they counted them. Um, so what you see here, so the, the two lower uh, lines that are connected by the blue curve, um, these are the results for one fermion generation. And the above uh, band with like the orange line, this is for three fermion generations. And here you see, for instance, at the dimension five, you have two parameters if you have one flavor generation because you have only that uh, uh, operator that we saw yesterday that gives a Majorana mass to neutrinos if you have only one flavor. And it has two parameters because that's not Hermitian. So it has a real and an imaginary part. So this is counting real and imaginary parts of everything. If you go to three uh, flavor generations, this becomes already 12 because you have a three by three symmetric matrix that is complex. So if you do the counts, you get 12. At dimension six, uh, there are 84 things for one flavor generation, but 3000 already for three fermion generations. And then it goes on and on and on. And notice that this is in log scale. Mm -hmm. uh, because we said we were gonna actually neglect left on bio number violation, sorry, bio number violation, not the left on one because I left the, the odd ones. Uh, the actual numbers that we need to care about are these. You might have heard of it, 2,499. This is the total number of parameters that you have in SMEFT with three generations if you neglect by your number violation. If you go to one flavor generation, there are 76, and then you move on. So the, the steps down are the odd dimensions because when you have a violation of B or L, uh, you're always, uh, somehow you always get less. It's just a combinatorics uh, thing. Uh, at dimension eight, this already goes to 37,000 almost, and you can get to yeah, millions very easily. Now, an interesting fact is that uh, people have uh, constructed bases for this. So I show you the worst of bases for the dimension six, but in the last, uh, so since 2020, I would say, uh, in some cases a bit, a bit earlier, um, there has been a lot of uh, development in this direction because people have developed like some sort of automation uh, to produce bases for anything. And they produce bases like crazy. And so we have uh, dimension eight bases already that have that even been, been used. Uh, this still fits in a paper. So they, they wrote it's a paper that's a bit long, but you can, you can read them off on a, on a LaTeX. Uh, then for dimension 10 and 12, there was a paper just earlier this year uh, and they didn't write it in a paper. <laughs> they provide a piece of code uh, that at the moment still needs to be converted into readable form, but it's still super impressive. Um, that produces yeah, the millions of uh, operators that, uh, that you might want to, uh, to check out. And for dimension five, there is only one guy. So we know dimension seven, we already have a basis as well. And I think also for, um, for dimension nine. So, the material is, is there, let's say. Uh, I just want to give a quick comment about why is there so many parameters? So you, you see already in the plots that I showed you that the number of flavor generations plays a giant role, right? Because you go 
from the blue line for one generation to um, the orange line for the three flavor generation. And because this is still log scale, it means that basically it increases by orders of magnitude just the fact that you have many flavors. Yes. I think it's, so these have to violate B or L and or L. Um, so you just have less fewer combinations essentially. It's just much harder to get odd dimensions because for instance, Lorentz indices have to go in pairs. So they're an even number. Uh, Higgs doublets have to go in pairs or an even number. So if you want to get odd, you have to play with fermions and charge conjugation. And in the end, the combinatorics is just this. Like if you had a theory different from the standard model, maybe it wouldn't be the case, but with the fields that we have and the charges that we have, that's. It just happens to be like that. But so it's kind of like two separate classes of operators and you clearly see that one follows a lower line compared to the others, right? So. Um, yeah, so this is a, a table for the dimension six that kind of gives you a sense of why we have so many. Uh, so it's a breakdown of how many parameters that are in each of the classes that I showed you before. Um, so in operators that have only bosons, so the, the X stays for, for a field strand. So X means a W mono, B mono, or G mono. Um, so when you have only field strands, there are, there are always two uh, CP even and two CP odd operators. That's it, there's nothing else you can do. Uh, for the sector with only Higgs, there are always three. Uh, stuff that corrects the kinetic terms, it's four plus four. And then the moment you start adding fermions, you see already like operators that have one single fermion current, so some psi bar psi structure. You already have uh, like one order of magnitude or two more. And you see the reason here, so whenever you have uh, let's start from this first. So whenever you have a current like this, so you have a current, so this one says there's a, a gamma mu and, and a uj, it doesn't really matter what comes in front. So what, what matters is the current. Uh, it means that the Wilson coefficient carried by this operator, we have actually some indices i and j. It's a, it's a tensor in the flavor space, if you want. Um, so with three generations, this is a three by three matrix, right? Um, and because the operator is Hermitian, so if, if you take the Hermitian conjugate, you go to u bar j, gamma mu ui, right? So what you get is that cij uh, dagger is equal to cji. So this has to be an Hermitian three by three matrix. Then, then you can literally think of, so this has uh, three entries that are real on the diagonal, they have to be real. And then you can have three that are complex so this makes, uh, well, three CP even plus three CP odd, and this makes three um, pure CP even. So only this operator in total has uh, nine parameters, so six that are CP preserving and three that are CP violating of the diagonal. If you go to things that flip chirality, so like that kind of structure there, so you have a QI sigma mono DJ, uh, or you could have it without this, you could just have the Yukawa correction is the same. This is not emission anymore, so if you take the emission conjugate, you get D bar Q, that's not the same operator. So this is a three by three complex with no symmetry structure, no relation between the entries. So this is just nine plus nine. Okay, so you have like nine real parts and nine imaginary parts. Uh, when you go to four fermion inter interactions, the game becomes even more fun. Um, now, you see here the numbers are large. Uh, so it is funny to identify what are the symmetries uh, and counting the parameters of these operators. So we can start from the easiest but worst case, which is the, the, the later one. So if you take an operator like this, this guy doesn't have any sort of symmetries. Like there's no way that you can move indices around and uh, relate them to, to each other. Okay, so this is completely asymmetric. So this is a three by three by three by three complex uh, matrix that you have to put in. So this has 18 real parts and 18 imaginary parts. So this guy alone brings in a 162. Of course, many of them violate flavor and we will come back to this later today. Uh, if you have an operator like this, this is already kind of better because you can see that this is a mission at least, right? So the E and E, so the E bar E and the U bar U by themselves, if you take the mission conjugate, they are the same. So that one has a symmetry that uh, I, J, K, L, if you dagger it, it's like 
J-I-K-L, and it's also related, well, now, um, well, okay, the, the full dagger of the thing is related to this, but then you also have some relation to the J-I-K-L and to the I-J-L-K, so you have some sort of permutations going around when you take the emission conjugate of the operator. Um, so this number, if you count, it goes down to 45 plus 36. And then the last class is this kind of operator here, which is quite nice because it has also a symmetry of exchanging uh, the two currents. So you can have uh, that if you flip the IJ pair with the KL pair, then you still get the same. So this is a bit more symmetric than that. So you get down to 27 plus 18. Uh, I think the most symmetric is the E bar E, well, gamma mu, and E bar gamma mu E. And this guy is more symmetric than that because this is a singlet um, under the hypercharge. And it's, uh, sorry, it's a singlet under SU2 and it's a singlet under SU3. It only has hypercharge, while that guy um, is charged under SU2. And so this is such that, so when you have no symmetry here, by Fiat's relation, you can exchange these two guys without paying any price. Uh, well, if I wanted to do the same with the doublet, I need to remember the completeness relation. So the fact that, so essentially I need to take care of the fact that I'm not just exchanging the flavor indices, but I'm also contracting this SU2 index with the other one. So I'm, I'm exchanging the contraction of SU2 indices. And there is a completeness relation that essentially tells me that if I have a delta to begin with, then I will end up with an operator that has explicitly Pauli matrices inside the current in order to fix this. So this would change basis, and it's not okay. So this cannot be done for this operator, but it can be done for this one because it doesn't have the SU2 charge. So this is even more symmetric than that, and it has uh, even fewer parameters. Okay, anyways, you can play with this endlessly. Uh, the point is that flavor really plays um, a major role in, uh, uh, in this. Um, I can quickly comment on one thing that uh, could be interesting. I hope it's not going to take me too much time. Um, in the concept of basis, so one important thing to keep into account is that the basis behaves as a basis. So there are a lot of interconnections uh, between the operators that can happen in general. So when you reduce your basis, effects go in, in several places. So if you keep looking at this table, for instance, you might think, okay, so I have some new physics and new physics uh, gives me corrections to, I don't know, triple gauge couplings that I find uh, somewhere in that combination of operators. And then whatever is the basis, I will always be able to identify a correction triple hex couplings. Or it gives me a correction to couplings to fermions and then new physics is gonna always fall in there. Actually all these, uh, they are completely basis dependent statements. Um, because so the, the equivalence of different bases is only manifest so the equivalence of different bases has to do with those redundancies there, right? And those redundancies appear when you really calculate a full scattering amplitude beginning to the end. So there are many uh, equivalences that turn out only, uh, only at the bottom. So the things are equivalent only when you put everything together. And there is one example that could be quite instructive. So there are two operators that you could write down. I'm gonna write down only one of them, uh, which is for instance this, you have a bimunu, a covariant derivative of the H dagger and the d nu of the h. So this is not there. I can tell you this is not part of the Wurzel basis. It is part of uh, a basis that is called Hist's, which is uh, Ajivara, Ishiara, I don't remember the S, sorry, and Zeppenfeld. Um, and it's one of the bases that were proposed during time before. This is something that produces um, triple Higgs coupling sorry, <laughs> triple gauge couplings. Uh, so you can have, for instance, a Z mu nu from here, and then you can take a W mu and a W nu, right? So this gives a correction to whatever it is, kappa Z, uh, or you can have, yeah, corrections also to the Higgs and something like that. So this is something that is used in the phenomenology of TGCs. Um, but it's not in that basis, right? So if you want to find it in the basis, what do you do? There's a long procedure that I will not do because otherwise we spend the entire lecture on it. Um, but at the end of it, you can trust me, you can get, so I'm going to call this OB to be short. 
this turns out to be equivalent to the following. You have a gauge coupling, you have a factor of 2i because uh, of normalizations, and then you have OHB divided by 2, OHWB divided by 2 tan theta minus H box divided by 2 HD minus the sum over the flavors essentially of, well, okay, I'm gonna write here because I don't have space. So this is minus the sum over flavors of the HU operator divided by, uh, so this is two thirds, minus the HD operator. So this is each um, fermion with its own hypercharge. HQ1 divided by six, the HL1 divided by two, and minus the HE. <laughs> so this is what this operator is equivalent to in that basis. So it has stuff that changes the Higgs coupling to the Z. This guy that we will talk about in a minute does everything. So basically it changes some mixing angle. Uh, stuff that modifies Higgs only um, interactions. And then the whole series of terms that correct the Z coupling to fermions, each of them proportional to the hypercharge. So this is telling you that if you, if you have a diboson process and you think, oh, I'm probing uh, the triple gauge coupling that is given by that operator, right? If you want to write that triple gauge coupling modification in the worst of basis, you really need to keep into account that in the worst of basis, you can have this guy that enters through some of these interactions, the bosonic one, but then you also need to have this sort of diagram, and then you will also have corrections to this diagram. So say that this is a W, right? W plus, W minus, you had the Z. Uh, well, this one, no, actually, because for the W, it doesn't enter in this case, but if you did it, okay. If you took another operator, this would enter as well. Um, yeah, so this is still the Z, the W, and the W. If you decayed, um, if you decay the bosons, then this might enter also in the decay, and so on and so forth. So this is telling you that, so what you call like a correction to a particular vertex is always a basis dependent statement, because if you change basis, that thing becomes a sum over several contributions um, that are not necessarily just a triple gauge coupling. So you can have, a sum of a correction here, which by the way looks different from that one, from the point of view of the uh, Lorentz structure, and a correction to uh, the Z interaction there. So this is always um, true in general, and it's one of the reasons why um, people now tend to put in all the possible operators when they calculate uh, processes. So the idea is that um, Every time one does a selection on the operators and says, okay, I calculate a process with only this one guy inserted in, um, then necessarily uh, you might miss some of the interactions that you have actually removed when you did the basis reduction. So like the, the basis is meant to be entirely there to cover everything, but it could be that there are some effects that you could have written down and then now are distributed over operators that you don't like anymore. Uh, but if you don't include them, you will never be able to reproduce it completely, right? So if you decided to do the analysis in the worst of basis without this object, then you would not be able to reproduce this one, which I find it interesting, or at least you would get a result that is different and it's not, it would not be a, a consistent analysis to compare, to compare the two objects, okay? So uh, the message is whenever you, so like, Vertices are not observables, right? So uh, anything that is related to a modify this particular interaction typically is a basis dependent statement. So this is one of the motivations for uh, including all the operators that give a numerically relevant contribution. Of course, there's always some sort of selection whenever the predictions are done because in this way, we're sure that we cover the entire uh, space of possible effects. Um, Okay, this is going, okay. So, um, two more words about 
the global idea of, of this MAPS program because it's kind of related to this. So we already said yesterday that the, one of the reasons why this MAPS is so popular lately is that because people are thinking of using it to um, discover some signal on your physics and also to interpret it um, and get some information out of it. Um, so in order to do that, uh, you realize now that it's important to really be inclusive. I mean, there are many things that one can do, so it depends on, on exactly which question do you want to ask, and this is just a tool, and you can use it in different ways, but uh, perhaps the most kind of ambitious way is to really try and get some information out of it. So to do that, um, you need to be inclusive, so you need to treat the basis as a basis, include all the possible contributions that come there, and there are two main uh, challenges that come with this uh, program. So challenge number one is to be even sensitive to these effects uh, because we said, okay, is MEF dimension six gives me something that is more or less suppressed by V squared over lambda squared. Okay, this is my expansion parameter. This is the size order of magnitude of the effects that I'm looking for. Um, so if you want to put in the number, V is 246. If you put lambda at, say, lambda is 2 TV, which is kind of the minimum that you could possibly assume, uh, I think this is already 1.5%. Let me check. Yes. Uh, one thing that you can try, and people are trying, is instead of sticking to effects that are V squared, uh, in some cases, you have suppressions of momentum squared over lambda squared, which means out of those operators, you pick um, cases where the, the dimensions is not added by constants, but it's added by derivatives, right? So this will give you energy enhanced interactions. And then you can go to high energy, such that you kind of uh, make this, this ratio larger. So in this case, say that you want to go to uh, one TV in the kinematic distribution that you're measuring, and then your new physics has to be at least at three TV, right? Because, okay, this is very, I mean, it's very rule of thumb, uh, but so you don't want to get close to the resonance, otherwise there's no point in using DFT, you could just use a model. Um, so minimum separation that you can have is kind of a factor of three, and this gives you a 10%. So this, are the numbers that I think people have in the back of their mind when they do this kind of uh, analysis. They are very, very, very rule of thumb uh, in the sense that in front of this factor, you can have further suppressions, you can have enhancements. Uh, the same happens here, it depends on what do you mean by P squared, by the PT, but so it depends on many things. We have no idea where lambda is. Um, but if we want to take more or less a reference for when does this make sense, which can be also a target for standard model precision calculations, like what is order of magnitude the size of the error bar that we want to have in order for these measurements to be possible at all. This is the answer. So 1.5% holds, let's say, in the bulk. Like if you're measuring a Higgs decay or a Z-pole observable, that's where you have effects that are suppressed by V squared over lambda squared. And this holds in the tails. So if you go to higher energy, order of magnitude, okay, very, very broad. So this is for you to have a quantitative uh, reference. Um, yes, okay, second challenge, because I said there are two, uh, is to make sure that we understand this correctly. So let's say of a correct interpretation. Um, because you can easily imagine that when you have 2,499 parameters, you calculate something, you calculate with finite accuracy, you make approximations, maybe you forget an operator, whatever you do. If there is a deviation, your feet will pick it up, okay? Your feet will tell you this is not compatible with the standard model. But then, when you, when you have to interpret it, so like you have some parameter space that charts uh, deviations from the standard model, and whatever parameter space you use, you will always find a spot this far away from zero if you have a deviation. This is what the fit will prefer. Um, but is that the right, <laughs> the right position? So if you want to really play the game of extracting information from this about new physics, so like is it 
left-handed, right-handed, does it couple to flavors uh, in the same way? Does it affect boson or only fermions? Anything of this sort, um, you need to make sure that you position your chart right and that you really capture correctly um, the deviation. So you assign it to the correct Wilson coefficients, let's say. And this is the part that is highly non-trivial, okay? So, well, this is also non-trivial. Then once you have sensitivity, finding a deviation, you find a deviation even if you do uh, a signal strength measurement, but then interpreting it, so using the framework to interpret it, is not um, is not so easy, and this is what I mean. Most of the people who focus on OSMEF right now are essentially working on. Okay, so this finally brings me to making predictions. So predictions are important in this because predictions are the ingredient that tells you what kind of deviation are you seeing, right? Um, so when you do predictions as math, I probably have a slide about this. Let's see. Uh, still sticking to dimension six? Yes, okay. Uh, so there are, many, uh, there are many things that you have to look at um, in principle, I'm gonna write down the amplitude first. So you typically, you take over scattering amplitude, right? So you have some sort of scattering amplitude and because we're doing an EFT, this is expanded in the series. So you're gonna have a dimension four, a dimension six scattering amplitude, and then you might have a dimension eight, whatever. So where I mean that this is the, essentially the standard model amplitude for the process that you have. This is the part that goes like one over lambda squared, and this is the part that goes like uh, one over lambda to the fourth in the amplitude. Then you want to do the prediction, so you have to square this guy, right? And so you re-expand, so you will have the standard model amplitude squared, this you always get. Then you will have uh, essentially the interference part, so this is twice the real part of A4, A6 dagger. So interference between standard model and dimension six. And then you will have the dimension six squared. And then you can have other terms. So you can have, I don't know, the standard model times the eight dagger and then the eight squared and so on and so forth. Um, so this object, does this work? Huh. So this object is gonna be of order one over lambda squared. Both these two are gonna be order one over lambda to the fourth. Um, and so you go on and on. So the thing that you should do technically is to expand at this level. So you expand at the level of the observable, you compute the observable order by order. Uh, sometimes what is most often done is to keep the quadratic, and I will tell you in a moment why. Um, but yeah, so the, the leading contribution should be this one that goes like one over lambda squared, and it's um, the interference piece. Now, you can also realize, if you think about it for a second, that if you think of a diagram, uh, I don't know, we can rethink of the diboson that we did before. Something like that. So the standard model diagram is the standard model diagram. The A6 is a place where you must have inserted one dimension six, all right, six operator once, okay? Because the moment you put one in, this already goes like one over lambda squared. So uh, anything that gives you the amplitude six means it's a diagram with one operator put in. Um, to get something that is dimension eight, you could do two things. You could either put two dimension six guys at the same time, so this is called a double insertion, or you could put only once one dimension eight guy. There's actually more things, but I will come to that later. So you could have, yeah, so this is one over lambda squared and lambda squared, it makes a four, and this is directly one over lambda to the fourth. So these two diagrams both fall inside uh, this object. If you remember what we said yesterday, uh, now this is three level, so it's not super relevant, but if you, when you start going to loop orders, this makes sense because we said this map is renormalizable order by order in dimensions. Okay. So whenever you have a divergence uh, that is generated by putting in two vertices of dimension six, 
it will have to be reabsorbed by a counter term that is dimension eight. So if you have two insertions of dimension six, then you will have the dimension eight at least to eat up the divergences. So typically when you look at math calculations that are done in data sure now, it's only this. The amplitude is one operator of dimension six and nothing else because then otherwise you have to go higher and higher and then you never stop. Um, okay, so I hope this counting makes sense. Now the story is even a bit more complicated than this. I'm not going into any details, but I just want you to give, I just want to give you a sense of uh, all the ingredients that enter. If you go specifically to the uh, LHC, um, the amplitude is not the only place where you can find SMAFT effects. In principle, we're not gonna cover them, but just be aware that they exist. Um, so for instance, you could have uh, effects in the PDFs in the sense that the PDFs are not derived from first principles, right? So the, first, the PDFs are obtained by fitting data that is obtained from deep inelastic scattering or other processes including TT bar production at the LHC for instance. Uh, so people measure all these scattering processes and they fit PDF parameters to them. Um, so there is a chance that if there is new physics hiding in there, basically its contribution gets eaten up in the PDF fit and you don't see it anymore as, as a new physics effect. You know what I mean? So it, it's like um, you don't know where the PDF goes uh, as a function of X. So the way that you extract it is that you take data, you assume that is standard model and you, you get the dots. Okay. You get many dots and then you do a fit and this will give you shape. Um, but if there is new physics hiding in there, you will basically just be assuming that whatever you see is standard model. So you kind of reabsorb the new physics contribution inside what you call a PDF, even though it wouldn't be the, uh, the PDF, but some resonance being exchanged uh, off shell in between. Um, so Maria, that, that will give you the lectures about the proton structure uh, on Friday. Uh, she is the greatest expert on this. So if you're curious, you can ask her. I'm not gonna comment further. Um, then there could be uh, some effects to take care of in uh, the shower and anadronization uh, component of your simulation. So think that you're doing on all the chain of the Monte Carlo, then you shower it. Um, I mean, this is not really uh, saying that SMEFT can enter into the shower and anadronization because this is low energy uh, QCD, let's say. So in the low energy limit, all the EFT effects should be negligible just for a matter of the coupling. But it means that when you, do, when you do a calculation of a prediction, you have to be careful um, because sometimes you have extra components that change the way that you have to do the matching uh, between the, the matrix element and the parton shower simulation. Or sometimes you need to, take, to be careful when you take care of uh, soft and collinear emissions because you have a chromomagnetic dipole, for instance, where uh, the gluon is not emitted from the usual vertex, but with a weird uh, Lorentz structure. So there are a couple of studies that uh, try to keep these into account. And then finally, um, if you're trying to calculate a, a process that is unfolded, so an unfolded cross-section, which means uh, this is something that's typically done by the experimentalists, but so you, you go to the LHC, you do a measurement, and essentially you are sensitive to the final states only in the fiducial volume of the uh, detector. You cannot see outside where the detector is not. So sometimes uh, from the measurement in a specific phase space region, they need to infer what was the total cross-section integrator over the whole phase space region. Um, and to do that, um, up to some point in the past or in many cases, it is assumed that the acceptance or the fraction of uh, decay products that fall inside the detector uh, compared to the total uh, phase space is standard model-like. So that was calculated with a standard model. So in, in undoing this process, they were assuming standard model behavior. Uh, but sometimes that is not true. So for instance, now I think it's become basically standard in the Atlas um, Higgs combinations where they do EFT fits. They always do this check. So uh, they have, for instance, like uh, this is Higgs production, is simplified temporal cross-section. So you have in this case, uh, the Higgs that decays to four leptons, and this is the invariant mass of the off-shell Z. Um, and what they do is that when they measure, they put a cut uh, at 12 uh, GV on the invariant mass of the two off-shell leptons. 
And if you are in the standard model, uh, you, you are on the black curve. So it means that you're cutting out this small fraction of the events. So they know that you know, the, the decay width that they measure with this cut is, I don't know, like 90% of the total one. But if you have an EFT operator, uh, some of these operators, because they introduce uh, photons, uh, they, they give peaks a lower uh, invariant mass. So it means that if for this operator, so for the component of this operator, the stuff that you measure with this acceptance cut is not 90%, but it's more like 50 uh, of, uh, of the total decay width. So you need to be careful and, and correct for this. Okay. So the message of this slide is, um, SMEF mainly goes into the hard matrix element. Okay, so the, the, way, the place where new physics does something is in the hard matrix element for the principle that we said yesterday of um, separation of scales. But when we use our machinery that we have in place to do these predictions, we have to be careful to include these effects not only in the hard scatter in Monte Carlo, but also to correct for potential other effects that change uh, along the whole, uh, uh, the whole chain. All right, so this is the same thing that I just showed you here. Um, the last thing that I was uh, missing to comment on is that, um, so there is this piece that is called quadratics, which is this guy here. So people typically calculate uh, the amplitude, putting in one if the operator of dimension six, so this is lambda three minus two, and then they square the whole thing. So if you square the whole thing, you get the standard model, you get the interference, but you also get this piece, which is this diagram squared, that goes like lambda uh, to the fourth. Now, this is of the same order of the, inter the interference between dimension eight and standard model. It's also of the same order as a bunch of other things. Um, so it's not, it's not a complete prediction uh, at this level, but it is a piece that uh, sometimes is kept. Number one, because we have it. It's very easy to calculate it. It's already there. We don't need to do anything more. Number two, because um, it makes the fit converge. So if you have only linear terms, so Important, the interference term is always linear in the Wilson coefficients, of course, because you have inserted only one operator, so it gives you a function that is completely linear in C. Well, this guy is quadratic. So whenever you want to go and do a measurement and constrain, um, constrain the, the physics that comes out of this, in, in, if you keep only the, linear, only the interference term, you will have a linear polynomial in the Wilson coefficients. If you keep this, you will have a quadratic polynomial. Also, this sum is positive definite because it's the square of this amplitude. So the combination of these objects will always be positive no matter what for any value of the Wilson coefficient even equal to a million if you simulated it right. Um, so it, does, so it, it is less buggy <laughs> uh, in, in fitting codes. It helps not having negative cross sections for which the fitting codes complain. Um, and it also has this feature that if you have a poorly constrained, um, let's say, uh, observable, so imagine that you have uh, two operators like C1 and C2, okay? So you have this parameter space, you do a measurement, and the measurement tells you that you have a preferred band. So if you're using only the linear term, you will find something that are not crosses through zero, right? So your one sigma or two sigma allowed region will be something like this. It passes through zero in the sense that if your measurement is compatible with the standard model, then the standard model is allowed, okay? So it has to be inside the band. Um, and you have something that is linear in these two uh, coefficients. So essentially you have to get a line uh, that crosses. But if you have uh, the quadratic piece, what you get in general is that this gains a piece that goes with C1 squared and one that goes with C2 squared. Uh, and in the polynomial that you're constraining, they always have a plus sign in front because C1 squared comes from this diagram squared, so it's positive. C2 squared comes from this diagram squared, so it's positive, right? And so the polynomial that you are constraining is always a compact structure, so it's, it's always some sort of, this thing is horrible, uh, is always some sort of ellipsis. Um, so it doesn't have uh, the infinite stretch that you get with the linear uh, with the linear component. So if you have like an unconstrained direction where you can go uh, arbitrarily far away in the linear case, in the quadratic case, you never have it because 
because your constraint essentially acts radially in the parameter space. If you're, you're saying that the, the, the sum of the squared of these two has to be less than something, so the radius in the plot has to be less than something. So this always gives you something finite, even if you have a poor constraint or if you really can break them down. Um, okay, so enough of this. Uh, another piece of information, so the state of the art for these predictions is that the amplitudes with uh, one's meft guy in uh, can be done up to one loop in a QCD and in a very few cases, uh, electric weak. Uh, so what I mean here is that you really have uh, all the set of diagrams that have one loop and one operator somewhere inside the diagram. Um, so they are automated up to one loop in, in QCD. You can do it with a Monte Carlo and we'll talk about it tomorrow. And for the electric weak case, uh, it's a bit more difficult because for the electric case, the structure of the counter attempts and the whole structure of the electric sector is a, a giant mess, so it took various years to sort out. Um, now I think it's quite understood, but the step to automating it is still, uh, is still quite um, challenging. So yeah, so this is the, the state of, uh, of the art. I don't think, so I think there is one two loop calculation uh, that has been done for one particular process in SMEFT, but nothing more than that. It was really like a two loop in QCD, uh, individual thing. Uh, okay, it's already way later than I thought. Okay, so um, the next thing that we're going to, so I'm gonna stop here in case you have any questions because now we're gonna start calculating and switch a bit gears. More or less clear? Okay. I'm going to erase a couple of blackbirds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay, clearly it would be nice to unify, right? Because you want to minimize all the potential errors and the things that you make in translating between one and another when you have to, so in the end you want to combine a lot of processes, right? So it's best if they're all expressed in the same parameter set. Uh, sometimes for historical reasons there are different bases that are used, which I mean, I think to some extent it makes sense. Um, the other thing to consider is merely practical. So, so like in principle there's no preferred basis, like from a theory point of view you can do whatever you want. But from a practical perspective, uh, there are only so many codes around. And so in many cases, so the people just use the Warsaw because for the Warsaw, the full uh, uh, matching running simulation chain is completely automated. And so it's kind of standard because it has standard tools attached to it. Uh, there are still some analysis that use, well, there are some analysis that use different bases with codes that were produced before. Um, and it's fine, and the thing is that the conversion is always a bit painful. I mean, it's the classic trivial thing that the human brain cannot <laughs> achieve every time. So there's really a lot of time spent into converting exactly how it comes out, and there are constants, so it's never exact. It's, so the, the conversion is less, so it's, it's more of a hassle than it would look in principle. And sometimes you cannot convert, because to convert you really need the whole basis. So if you have, uh, for instance, the hist spaces that I mentioned before, it was defined to do like the boson scattering, right? So they had operators with bosons and they studied them for a long time like this, which was fine for the time. But now if you want to convert to Warsaw so basis, you need to tell me exactly which other operators are you going to complete the hists with because the final result is gonna depend on that. So it's really like, just like the concept of, um, Imagine that you have a vector basis, no? And then, so you tell me only what is the Y component. How do I decide what is the X? You need, I need to know which other vector completes your basis. Otherwise, there is no way that I can rotate to another space. And sometimes that's not fully defined or there are pieces, so yeah. Sometimes theoretically you kind of have this, uh, this small issue. Okay, so uh, the next thing that we do is that we start to calculate, and so I think I'm gonna bring the basis back so that we look at it. 
so this basis is very nice. It has many advantages, but it has a few disadvantages. Uh, some of them are inevitable. Um, and most importantly, this is not something that is um, quite ready for phenomenology because it has all sorts of things that need to be cleaned out uh, first. So the first thing that needs to be cleaned out, if I okay, find the right notes, um, is where your vacuum is. So the first thing that you need to look at is how the electric symmetry breaking happens in the, in the potential. So the, the potential that you have at this point when you write down the standard model plus that basis is that you have the mass of the Higgs and H dagger H, then you have, I'm gonna normalize it in this way, lambda and the, and the cortex, sorry, two. Uh, and then you have that guy, so you have the operator O phi that I'm gonna call OH, not to mix phi's and H's. Uh, which is the H dagger H uh, cube. This is a minus because the Lagrangian contains minus the potential. So if that goes with a plus in the Lagrangian, it goes with a minus with the potential. Okay, it's a convention. Um, so typically when you're here uh, in the standard model, the, the thing that you do is that you look for what is the expectation value of this guy. And this is the vacuum of the theory, right? Is the V, well, the V squared over two. Um, so in the standard model, you get, uh, okay, fine, you get, you get your typical expression, which is the, the, the mass and the lambda, so in ratios. So it's, right, in the standard model, you should get the mh squared over, I think it's a four lambda, right? But now you have that guy, All right? So now you have this thing, and this clearly moves uh, your potential around. So what you need to do is to reminimize this whole expression and then you need to expand it out in uh, one over lambda squared. And what you will find is that this, is, this receives a correction, which is mh, three mh squared over eight lambda squared ch over big lambda squared plus something of order lambda to the minus four. And this quantity here, if you want, you can rewrite it as three times the standard model of F squared divided by four lambda. And okay, this was uh, the standard model squared over two, just to be clear, okay. So is it, is it clear what I'm doing? So I'm repeating the, the two x symmetry breaking that we do in the standard model, but now with the extra guy. So before you just got some V squared over two, they had this particular relation to uh, the uh, potential parameters. Now that you have SMEFT, you re-minimize, you refine where the minimum is, and then you expand out in, uh, in lambda. Um, and this is something that you do all the time. So your Lagrangian at this point is defined up to order one over lambda squared. So we expand, expand, and expand, and only keep the, the first term, and this helps a lot. If we wanted to go to dimension eight, we would have one more operator here, and then we would need to solve again with the one more operator and expand up to lambda to the fourth, okay? So if we had dimension eight, we would have the dimension eight operator contribution to this, and then something that goes like CH, over, CH squared over lambda to the fourth as well. So we would need to keep the, the next order for everything. The first order is very simple. Uh, okay, so what we do at this point is that we call this the true vacuum of the theory. Um, so there are many vacua. <laughs> so there is the one that you had in the standard model. There is the true vacuum of the theory here. Now, one interesting point is that the one in the standard model and the one uh, that is actually the vacuum now, they are equal up to um, lambda to the minus two corrections, right? So when we write, when we look at this particular piece, this is the same as Vt squared over four lambda times one plus some order lambda minus two correction, okay? So I'm kind of taking this expression and reiterating it inside of it. Uh, the point that I want to make is that 
So this quantity multiplies already an EFT correction. And so because we're working only at leading order in lambda squared, inside here, I might as well write the true vacuum because anyways, it's equal to, to this one up to corrections that would enter at the lambda to the minus four uh, term at this point. And this is a trick that here might look redundant, but they're we actually going to use quite a bit in the next uh, steps. So the point is what you do with this is that um, essentially you know that, so this is your vacuum. So in the rest of the theory, when you want to open up in the broken phase and go, for instance, to unitary gauge, then you will have to replace your Higgs doublet with the true vacuum plus the excitation around it over the square root of two. Okay. So this we will do this in uh, the standard model. Well, in all, in all the Lagrangian, let's say. Okay. Uh, so every time we open this into the vacuum, now this V will have V a VT to signal that that's that point. Now, because we're just going to write VT instead of V, it doesn't really matter. So you will not see any visible consequence anywhere in the Lagrangian. Like you can forget what what this VT is for most of the phenomenology, but where it matters, so where you will still have a physical difference, is in the relation between VT, the mass of the Higgs, and lambda. So the, the point of that correction is not that everything shifts, everything is just expanded around some vacuum. So now, now we will say that this VT is the 246, okay? So it, it doesn't really matter. But what really changes is that this VT does not have a standard model relation to the mass of the Higgs and the lambda. It has this relation to uh, the mass of the Higgs and the lambda, and it is corrected by a free parameter. So this is something that has a physical effect only in the scalar potential. Okay, so now we go and we do this. So we really uh, take, um, so go to the broken phase, expand everything out. You can think that we do this over the whole Lagrangian, so the standard model piece and the SMAFT piece. And the next problem that we meet is the kinetic terms. Um, let's say first the one of the Higgs. So you do that replacement, well, of the little h, really, of the physical Higgs. So you do the replacement in your standard model Lagrangian, so the d mu h dagger, d mu h, and in those two guys that you have there in the class two. And you will find uh, that your Lagrangian now contains uh, this object, so a d mu h, d mu h over two, which is the standard, uh, standard model uh, piece. And then you will have a c h box v t squared over lambda squared, d mu h, d mu h, which comes from that uh, box operator. And then a c h d v t squared over lambda squared with a factor of uh, four at the denominator, and again, d mu h, d mu h, plus all the other terms. So by gauge invariance, of course, every time you open these guys, you have more interaction stem that come out. Uh, but if you just take the piece that has two physical Higgs and two derivatives, the one that defines the two-point function, you will get something from the standard model, something from the operator CH box, and something from the operator CHD. So it means that your kinetic term really looks like the one that you wanted, but multiplied by one minus uh, two CH box, I'm gonna use this notation, I'll tell you what this is, plus CHD divided by four. Now I'm gonna do this, important, I'm gonna call C whatever is C times VT squared over lambda squared. Okay, for economy of notation because otherwise there are many V over lambda squared. So now you have this object, and the, the problem is that when you calculate Feynman diagrams, so typically um, 
you want to have your kinetic terms of the field that is canonically normalized. So if you have uh, like d mu h, d mu h that has an arbitrary number in front, um, what you would need to do is that when you calculate a process, you have to remember that when you subconsciously use the LSZ formula, uh, there is a point where you have to divide off by the normalization of the field. So it's not accidental that you have a one half d mu h d mu h in the standard model, this is your choice, or that you have uh, the minus one fourth f mu nu f mu nu. That particular normalization is necessary because it's the one that makes uh, your asymptotic state canonically normalized, so with a normalization equal one. So if you have another number that is in front, you might decide to go and change your LSE formula, so every time that you have uh, the Higgs as an external state, you divide off by the square root of this number. Or another thing that is more convenient, because you want to forget about the LSE, you're not sure how to use it, you just want to work out normally um, the Feynman diagrams as usual, is that you can just redefine the Higgs field. Okay, so one thing that we're gonna do is that we're going to call these quantities minus delta kappa h, so whatever it is, this is minus delta kappa h. And what you can do, I can erase this. What you can do is that you renormalize uh, the field little h, sending it into uh, h times 1 plus delta kappa h, essentially. Yes. Um, so, what you're really doing, sorry, let me do it slower. So, you want to send it into 1 uh, minus 2 delta kappa h over the square root, right? So, if you have that expression, and you renormalize the h field dividing by the square root of this, then you have two h's, so the square root goes away, and then the denominator cancels with the numerator above. Because what we do is expand, uh, this is basically the same as one plus delta kappa h plus anything of order lambda minus four. And now you do this everywhere, in the Lagrangian. So you just shift things around. Luckily, because we're working at dimension six, we only need to do this on the standard model Lagrangian. Why? Because if you have a dimension eight operator, the dimension eight operator comes already with a C over lambda squared in front, right? So you have something that contains, so there's an operator that contains uh, the Higgs and that already has some uh, uh, C over lambda squared in front. If I do this redefinition, I send it into itself plus something that contains C over lambda squared times delta kappa H and the same operator again, just linearizing it out. So this is a contribution that is of order lambda to the minus four. Right, so if I, if I do this in something that already has a lambda in front, I, I push it to the next order. And because I'm truncating at the first, basically I might as well not do it. It's kind of the same reason why these two Vs are the same uh, when they multiply the C in front, because of any difference goes into a high order result. So in practice, we only need to do this in L standard model. What it means is that um, if you have a Higgs interaction in the standard model, like uh, BB bar Yukawa coupling, well, yeah, that was the bar, and this was the Higgs, something like that. Um, so this went like uh, the Yukawa of the B times V square root of two, there was an I, okay, you have a Feynman rule that is the standard model Feynman rule. Uh, now, because of this redefinition, you will have to multiply this by one plus delta kappa H. So what you did is that you moved as math correction to the two point function of the Higgs to as math correction to the interaction of the Higgs. In the end, the physics is the same. Like if you calculate consistently, you get exactly the same result for the amplitude because that's invariant under this kind of redefinitions. 
Um, but it's kind of a more practical way of, of using it. So we are more used to thinking in terms of vertices than two-point functions. Does this make sense? So this is an operation that is necessary. If you, like, you take this, you cannot just calculate with this and ignore things. So you need to make sure that your fields are properly normalized and that everything is working as, as you would like to. Um, so this kind of uh, reasoning is done in a few places, and I will show you another one in a second that is a bit more complicated. Um, but yeah, it happens so quite, quite a lot. The thing is that the only part that is affected is really the standard model Lagrangian. Other message to take home, if you want to do dimension eight, things become significantly more complicated because every time we said, now I expand, you need to go to the next order. So you will have the dimension eight operator, but you will always have also the next order of this guy. So you will need to do this redefinition with the linear piece onto the dimension six Lagrangian you will need to get the definition onto the standard model Lagrangian up to C squared over lambda to the fourth. Um, yeah, and you will also need to take care of the other, of the other piece. So like the level of complication that uh, enters if you want to go to the next order is not just, oh, I put in one more operator, but it's really, um, I mean, I think you can, you can see it very clearly here. So the operators that come, that come in this uh, delta, so any uh, function that went into some redefinition. Um, they will also have some C squared terms in the Lagrangian. So if you want to go to the dimension eight, you will need to have some delta kappa H squared, which means that your vertex of H BB will have a contribution of CH box squared. So it's one vertex that goes with the dimension six squared contribution. And if you want to calculate consistently up to one turn under to the fourth, you have to keep that and make sure that you know where, where it is going. So it's not just two insertions into different vertices, but it's also one vertex that goes quadratically. Yes. Uh, that's a million dollar question. So, so far they have mostly gone to one loop with dimension six, which is not trivial anyways, but, uh, it's something that people can stomach a bit more. <laughs> uh, so for going to dimension eight, so there is now a code done by the modern version of the Warsaw group. Uh, they, they just put out, it's called SMEFT FR, where they have uh, these kind of redefinitions calculated for the first time and automated somehow in there. So they have a uh, fine rules with the Lagrangian that contains these pieces. But otherwise, as far as I know, yeah, and there's maybe one other paper by uh, Ken Mimazu and some other people that where they started. And also, yeah, so there's a few isolated cases of processes where people try to put in a dimension eight part, um, but it is not completely customary to do this whole thing. So this has been done only in a very few cases because it gets, so I think. <laughs> No, it's a lot. Also because these are the same guys that enter in the usual quadratic, right? So it's a, so when you when you do the thing that we were looking at before, now that you have the, uh, where is it? This thing, oops, no. This thing here, right? So this goes like dimension six squared. And people like it because, oh yeah, this is good. And then you do that and it enters the same exact thing with the same size, because why would it be different? With a minus and it changes completely the entire thing. Because this is one vertex with C squared, so it can have negative interference. So this is not positive definite anymore. It's not very convenient anymore. It doesn't do the, the ellipse anymore. So I think people don't do it also because it, it makes things more difficult and not clearly as advantageous. <laughs> but yeah, if you wanted to do it, so like in a few cases where you can keep things under control, you can do some studies. But yeah, it's not... Uh, Okay, so now I'm gonna add one more complication. <laughs> this is gonna go worse and worse for a bit, but the lecture is almost over, so. We will break it down. So another piece where you have uh, this issue of the kinetic terms is for the gauge bosons. 
you don't really have it for the fermions because the Warsaw basis doesn't give you this, so this is really basis dependent. So the Warsaw basis doesn't give you corrections to the kinetic term of the fermions, but it does give you some to the kinetic term of the bosons that we showed before. Yeah, this, this, uh, I keep, uh, this guy's here. Okay, so when you take the part that goes with V squared in these guys, you clearly add constants to the kinetic terms of the gauge bosons. So I'm gonna give you one case, and then the, the other two are basically the same. So for the B, you have B mu nu, B mu nu, and then you will find uh, one minus two CHB bar, and by bar I mean uh, V squared over lambda squared. Uh, so there's a minus here because the operator conventionally enters with a plus, but then it has to be normalized to the minus of the kinetic term that is canonical. Uh, so you have exactly the same problem that you had with the Higgs. Uh, so what you want to do is essentially the same thing. So you send B into one plus CHB bar. Okay, so at this point you should have cleared that once you expand, uh, you square this so it becomes a plus two and it cancels off the minus two that stays there. So you end up with a, with a one. But this is a gauge field. So uh, when you do um, the gauging in QAD for the very first time, you are introduced to the fact that you have, you have the gauge field and you have the coupling constant, right? And um, the, basically the normalization, so, Okay, I'm gonna write it this way. So you have your covariant derivative. Now I'm gonna write it for QAD, but this is identical. Your covariant derivative is like this. If your kinetic term is a minus one fourth F mono F mono. Or sometimes in some textbooks, you can also find that your covariant derivative is this without a coupling constant there, uh, but your kinetic term as an E squared here, right? Have you ever seen this? Okay, so the, the physics in here is that the coupling constant is the relative normalization between the interaction in the covariant derivative and the normalization of the field. Okay. And everything else is unphysical. So if I shift this guy, I want as well to shift its own coupling constant that comes with it by the opposite, such that the product of G times B remains unchanged. So what I want to do is really to normalize the gauge field and keep this constant. Uh, well, because it is convenient, clearly, but also because any other difference would really be unphysical because I can always redefine the coupling constant to reabsorb the correction, essentially. So it, it's really like there is no... Um, so because we are not breaking gauge invariance as, as before, there is nothing in this math that is breaking this product here physically. So you really want to keep this um, together in such a way that it, is, that it is unchanged. So you do this for the three, for the B, for the W, for the G. Uh, what this does is that because you are choosing to keep uh, the product of G times B constant, it means um, that so you will end up in, in this case here, right? So that's the normalization that we're using. So we're gonna have a kinetic term for the, for the gauge field that remains canonical, perfect. And then every time the gauge field goes somewhere into the covariant derivative, there will be no dependence of the coefficient there because we shifted also the coupling constant in such a way that this disappears. So these guys will not go anywhere. Basically, they disappear from the kinetic term, they disappear from the covariant derivative, they don't touch anything else. Um, the only thing that remains of this is the part of the operator that went with the Higgs. So you will still keep something uh, that goes like uh, CHB, well now it would be a VT over lambda squared, and the Higgs and B mu nu, B mu nu. Okay, so this is another term that appears when you open uh, the H dagger H well, there's a factor of two walls. At the H dagger H uh, factor in front, you will also have the same with CHB and H squared over lambda squared B mono B mono. Okay, so from here you can get uh, couplings between two photons and two Higgses. Why not? Um, so this Wilson coefficient will do something. So it will do something when you when you take the other parts of uh, 
of the operator, but the part that goes with the constant, so the v squared part, vanishes. It's completely unphysical and you can get rid of it during doing this thing. Um, yes. Uh, the situation is more tricky um, for this guy here. So, okay, the CPO ones I'm not looking at because clearly they don't change the kinetic term. They give you uh, FF duals uh, in the Lagrangian. So all these guys disappear completely from the constant part, but this guy has a different contraction. This has the W and the B. And this <laughs> is slightly more problematic because this guy gives you a kinetic mixing between the W3 and the B that you need to re-diagonalize. So another thing that you find opening up the Lagrangian, tell me this is not, yes, is that your Lagrangian contains uh, these guys. So there is a CHWB bar uh, one half, a B mono, and the W3 mono. It is a W3 because, it, because in the Lagrangian, in the operator, you have uh, W mono and then the Higgs again, right? And then because the Higgs uh, in the VEV has a zero V, essentially, so you take, you take only the, uh, lower right component of the Pauli matrix and it contains uh, the minus W3 inside here. It's the same reason why you pick the, the Z mass when you, when you have the master. Okay, so this is a kinetic mixing, not good. <laughs> it means that we have a propagator that switches between W3 and B. So you don't want to calculate with this either. So we need to undo it. And the way that uh, you undo it, okay, you can do it in a, in a few steps, uh, but in the end of the day, you can trust me that, so you have to do this and then remember you still have the mass mixing, right? So that comes from the standard model. So you have to do the thing in two steps. In the end, you can do it in, uh, in one, doing it in this way. So you can go, so you can replace your W and B with a rotation minus sine theta, sine theta cos theta of these have to become the Z and the photon. Um, but now the point is who is theta? Well, theta is such that the tangent of the mixing angle is the one that you had before. Clearly you have to recover the standard model in some limit. Uh, plus one half CHWB bar times one minus G prime squared over G squared. So this is very fun, this does not disappear. This actually goes everywhere. Um, it's essentially telling you that you have a correction to the mixing angle, uh, which is a bit funky because it comes in from the kinetic term and not the mass term. Um, but that's what it is physically in, in the end of the day. So uh, if you do this rotation with this angle here and then you expand, it's a bit lengthy, but you can check that you get the diagonal masses um, the photon is massless because we're not breaking QED. Um, and you get also the uh, diagonal kinetic terms. Okay, so now I need to think if I should jump. Uh, yeah, okay, so I think. Um, Yes, so this is the point where the Lagrangian stands after doing all the steps that we have done up to now. Um, so the formula, the, the first formula here shows you what the scalar potential looks like. So if you remember wrapping up with it first, the two symmetry breaking, find the true vacuum. What that changes is the relation between the coupling. So the, the true vacuum is called VT and it is, still has the value that we know. But now if you look at the, at the couplings, um, so the, the mass of the Higgs uh, comes out with this factor in front. So the, the mass of the Higgs has the same expression that it had before. So lambda V squared, but it has a correction that goes like two 
delta kappa h that comes from uh, that redefinition up there, the one of the kinetic term. And it has a piece that goes like ch bar that comes from the fact that now the v is the new v, is not the old one. Um, so, so the relation between the v and the lambda is changed that in, if you want to write it that way, this is the new expression. And the triple Higgs coupling also gets this sort of correction and the core tick. And then you get, um, <laughs> it's a bit cut out, but you had an H to the five and an H to the six couplings as well that come directly from the operator uh, H dagger H to the cube. Um, if you look at the masses of the gauge bosons, I just told you they are diagonal, the photon is massless, everything is fine. But there is a small detail, so when you write down the mass of the Z, now uh, you get contributions to these operators here. So this is the CHWB that comes from this. So you had uh, the mass term from uh, the standard model and you did the rotation with this angle. Well, that's what it spits out. It spits out the CHWB in this funky combination that goes into the mass term. And the other piece is another CHD piece uh, that comes out just by opening the operator. So this is, um, um, it's an operator that, okay, uh, violates the Costello symmetry, but in some ways looks like the kinetic term of, uh, of the standard model. So it still has some uh, D mu H dagger, D mu H uh, structure that spits out a, a Z mu, Z mu. It doesn't give you any uh, WW structure because it breaks the Costello symmetry. We're not gonna discuss that, but essentially the point is that it contributes to the Z and not to the, not to the W. And this is the explicit breaking that it gives you. It's the raw parameter if you have ever heard about it or like the, anything that breaks the symmetry between the two. And then in a generic covariant derivative, uh, so this is again relevant for when the covariant derivative goes in the standard model, right? Because if it goes into a dimension six operator, so all these deltas we can forget because they are high order. So for the covariant derivatives that go in the standard model, uh, the, the piece with the photon will get this delta alpha correction that goes with CHWB. This comes also from this. So you do this rotation from the angle that has been changed. So it, it spits out consequences a bit in the photon side and a bit on the Z side. So in the Z it changes the mass, in the, Z, in the photon the mass is not there so it cannot do it, but it still enters into the coupling. Um, and then also the couplings of the Z bosons are gonna be um, corrected. So there's a piece that goes with the isospin and a piece that goes with the electric charge. Uh, and they also have corrections from CHWB because of this, uh, uh, of this object here. Um, and this is only for the covariant derivative. So, okay, so, so this is the piece that comes from expanding the covariant derivative. Then I told you before, you will have corrections to the Z couplings that come from operators that give couplings of the Z to, to fermions, right? Uh, so this is the piece that will come from essentially the standard model Lagrangian, and then there's the piece from the dimension six Lagrangians, and one has to sum them together. Um, but yeah, so you get here, and uh, we are uh, done for today. But the point is, uh, we are not uh, quite ready yet to do phenomenology because there is one last step that is still missing, which is um, renormalizing this in a sense, not in the sense of loops, but in the sense of uh, associating, so defining what the parameters that sit in this Lagrangian mean in terms of observables. So if you haven't heard about it yesterday or today yet, it's probably gonna come uh, in the next renormalization lectures, but the point is you define some sort of renormalization um, scheme where you want to say, okay, my electromagnetic constant is the one that I measure, for instance, in uh, Thomson scattering, a low energy in the Q square goes to zero limit, okay? So you have to define what these uh, parameters are in a relation to, uh, to observables, and this is gonna shuffle some things around. So like this object, collectively, including this alpha correction, is going to be the new alpha electromagnetic. Um, if we decide that alpha is one of our uh, renormalized couplings and, and so on. So the last step is, is needed to do the, say, connection of observables to observables. So at this point, the Lagrangian is completely well-defined, all the kinetic terms are canonical, the mass are there. So it has some expressions in terms of some parameters. Um, but if we want to do the exercise of assigning numerical values to this, um, parameters because we want to put them in a Monte Carlo, for instance, then we need to know what they are in terms of observables because we need to take them from some other measurements and, and plug them in. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think I can uh, interrupt here for today and we do this last step tomorrow.